<clears throat> um, you know, I've told this story up here a few times. I feel really hot. I don't know why. Um, but uh, w- one year at least, when, when I was in seminary, I was working like four jobs at a time, sometimes to try to make things work. And uh, we, it, it was tough. And I remember one year, I filed the taxes at the end of the year, and I realized that my adjusted gross income for the year was less than our rent for the year. And we were all still alive, and we kept going. So God is faithful. I don't know how sometimes, how he does things he does, but he is faithful. Thank you, that feels better to me. A couple things I want to mention that that you should know about, and most of this data you can get at the Connect Corner, but um, we're we're having a chili cook-off contest. So uh, if you make a pot of chili, you can sign up to make it back there in the Connect Corner. So that's going to be October 13th. So put that on your schedule. Come out. Last year, I think, it had to be last year because it, it was after, you know, we weren't supposed to be in the building. We had it out here on the, on the parking lot, and we just did staff cooked chili that year. This year, I don't want to cook chili, so I'm inviting you to cook chili. And uh, we're going to use our patio. Patio! I'm so happy about the patio. That's new. Um, another thing I want to mention is a conference coming up. It's called Hutch Moot. It's about beauty and poetry and art. Um, and Tony Mitterling isn't here with us today. He's, he's got some stuff going on. But he asked me to tell you that you don't have to be artsy to love it because he's not artsy and he loves it. He did it last year and he's been a big proponent. That's um, a couple of weeks, October 8th and 9th. Now, we don't do a whole lot of that announcements. And, you know, you know some big things that I'll tell you about. Actually, I sent an email this week that has a whole lot more information about both of those. Check your email. Uh, go to the Connect Corner. We want to be, instead of having a slide and reading it to you so that you get it from right here, we want to enable you and empower you to get information. Because we're inviting everybody. Everybody from the, the little ones to the oldest among us. We are inviting us into deeper connection with Christ and with others. Um, For far too long, the church has been a place where you come and you get what you need and then you quietly exit without engaging. And we're, we're inviting everybody to engage, even if that's just walking to the corners yourself to find out information. That's an opportunity for us to go a little bit deeper. That's what we're doing. Um, that's what Jesus is doing. That's what Jesus is always doing, is inviting people deeper into connection with him and others. And honestly, he often uh, upsets people along the way. He upsets desires. He upsets expectations. And we're going to look at a text this morning. In Mark chapter 3, and by the way, if you've got one of these, this is, this is actually a Bible This can be too, and I recognize that. You might have one on your phone, that's fine. But if you use paper still, I'm going to show you a trick that that my Sunday school teacher taught me when I was probably about five. If you open this thing right in the middle, you'll be about in Psalms, and I am about in Psalms. And then if you open the second half in the middle, you'll be about in Matthew, and I am in Matthew, and Mark comes right after Matthew. So that's a way you can find your way around Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the biographies of Jesus. We're in Mark chapter 3 today. I'll just read a few verses from it in a minute. But while you flip or tap your way over there, um, let's talk about that. Expectations of religious leaders. I'll read it in a minute. But we all have certain expectations of religious leaders, don't we? I am absolutely certain that some of us, maybe even here, you might think, certainly that guy would never cuss or fight with his wife. And you would be mistaken. Sorry to shatter your expectations. Now, to be fair, there are other people who have a different sort of expectations. They expect religious leaders to be uptight, self-righteous, maybe easily offended. 
I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations, and I've got a good conversation with somebody going on for an hour or two, right? And then they'll find out what I do for a living. And their eyes will get real big, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but did I, did I say something? What words did I use in that conversation up to now? And they start freaking out. I'm like, dude, it's okay. I mean, I, you know, don't, I'm not, uh, you're not going to offend me. And it takes some people a very long time to believe that because it comes sometimes for some people with this expectation. Now, people around the time of Jesus were no different than people now. They had certain expectations of religious leaders to act a certain way, and these were expectations that Jesus did not meet. This caused some problems for the people of his era, with that's part of why they never could fully accept him. It's also, by the way, part of why he ended up dying, because he didn't live up to their social norms and expectations. Today we're going to look at one of those times that he did not live up to it. And his response is not like mine. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> his response is to get, he, it tells us, he, he gets ticked off. He's upset with them. And we'll see this because their expectations were actually hurting people made in the image of God. So let's take a look. I'm going to read Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Again, he entered the synagogue. This is the the. the the church, the, the place the Jewish people gathered for worship. A man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians how to destroy him. Side note, this is not part of the sermon, but I need you, you we all need to understand this. That right there, the Pharisees held counsel with the Herodians. That would have shocked everybody who first read this that is the equivalent of this statement um donald trump worked together with nancy pelosi it's i mean the, the extremes over here they come together to destroy jesus i just think it's really important for us to understand that's not the point let me pray for us before we dig into this text god we're all gathered here today with um baggage. <laughs> no, maybe we didn't sleep well. Maybe we got something going on that's just stressing us out. Maybe we feel really good about something we've done um, or, or something you've done or we've, we've all got something. Would you just help us to bring all of that in and, and lay it before you? And, and, and Jesus, would you work, spirit, would you work in us by the word of God? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, on this day in the synagogue, the people gathered had an expectation, although, to be fair, they probably had an expectation that he wouldn't live up to it, but they had a standard and a certain expectation that you don't work on the Sabbath. It's not okay. And there were volumes and volumes written in ancient Aramaic by these people that were gathered in the synagogue, Oh, really over centuries, that told them exactly to the letter how to apply some of these Sabbath laws. I'm going to give you a little example. Um, they asked, okay, so if you're not supposed to carry a burden on, a, on the Sabbath, what is a burden? This is one of their answers. Just quick, I'm gonna, to give you a sample, this is what it says. What's a burden? They're asking in this commentary, this ancient Jewish commentary. Food equal in weight to a dried fig. Enough wine for mixing in a goblet. Milk enough for one swallow. I don't know if it's interesting or telling or not that you seem to be able to carry more wine than you can milk, but whatever. Honey enough to put on a wound. Oil enough to anoint a small member. Water enough to moisten an eye. You can't carry more water than you can put in your eye. 
paper enough to write a customs house notice upon. I don't know how much paper it took to write a customs house notice upon, but you could only carry ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet. So it was really crazy and very specific how, how to the letter they got. And these sorts of things are the, the way the, they insisted people behave and perform in order to please God. Now, I know that some of us here, and I know some, who some of you are, grew up in churches where you absolutely could not mow your lawn on a Sunday or go outside and play ball in the backyard with your kids, right? So you get it, how this works when you apply these laws and these strict rules, and it feels so pointless. Now, ironically, let's be honest about this, a large chunk of the culture that was indoctrinated, <laughs> brought up in these very strict rules, has now um, cast off rest altogether. And it has traded in performing for the neighbors by not going outside on Sunday to performing for themselves or for their neighbors maybe by working really hard, by always going, by achieving, by never missing a text. Right? I don't know if that if you find yourself in that, take it for what it is. But these religious leaders there in the synagogue that day expected Jesus to uphold their idea of religious righteousness. And here's the thing. Those ideas that they had were there to prove how special they were. Human beings in every generation, we all want to be special. We want to have a certain standard of behavior that we can adhere to, to demonstrate just how great we are. We want to be admired by others. Now that can vary. It might be, oh, she's so pretty. He works so hard. He's so smart. She's really made a name for herself, right? His store is always closed on Sundays. <laughs> he doesn't let anybody tell him what to do. He lives his own life the way he wants to. We have all kinds of things, right, that make us fit in. How about, how about he's really vocal about making sure everybody knows the vaccine is bad, or he's really vocal about making sure everybody knows they have to get vaccinated, right? So we prove ourselves and we fit in, and we have these different standards, but it's always in our hearts about fitting in with somebody, about measuring up, about being good enough. It's what Jesus and the New Testament writers would have called salvation. That's what it feels like, what it feels like to belong. That's called salvation. But if you know anybody with a disability, or maybe if you have a disability yourself, you might be able to imagine what it might have been like for this guy with a withered hand. Now, one commentary that I read said that he probably had approached Jesus before the service and asked to be healed. And, and maybe, we're not told. It doesn't say, just as he was there. But I'm not so sure. When I think about that scene, when I imagine what it might have been like, I'm betting that guy was sitting in the back of the room hoping nobody would notice him. Because we've all seen that, haven't we? I bet he spent his whole life up to this moment in the synagogue getting funny looks. Whether people were afraid of him or pitied him or, or looked down on him or, or just avoided him altogether. The sad reality is this guy had a harder time than others of just fitting in. And we all know it. And this catches the heart of Jesus. He sees this guy that can't fit in. Other people are avoiding eye contact, right? Mm, that's that guy with the hand. This is the reality. We know it's true. And if Jesus sees him. Stop right there for a minute. Something that, that we notice if you go through the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
pay attention when Jesus sees somebody. Usually, it's not just visual. There's a sense of intimacy, of, of knowing that is connected to that. Jesus sees somebody and there's, there's an intimacy. Now, here's what's interesting. We often have, we have this phrase, and sometimes we say it, sometimes we, chances are, maybe one of our parents or grandparents said it to us and it's stuck and now we say it to ourselves, Jesus is watching you. And that's never good, is it? <laughs> but that's just wrong. When Jesus sees us, it doesn't lead to anger. It leads to compassion, to mercy, because he sees what is broken. See, we have a tendency, and we're right, we, we, we think of our misdeeds, our sins, our wrong behaviors, our, our disobedience, and that's true, okay? It's true. We do that. Pick whatever word you like, but that's right. But that's not when Jesus is looking. That's not what he sees. He sees the brokenness that underlies it and that gives life to every sin. The wounds, the fears, the insecurities, the overcompensating, the hiding, all those things that we're engaging in when we sin, right? Sin is just an outflow of fear or of longing, an unmet longing or heartache. Jesus sees that, and he feels compassion for it. The problem is this compassion runs right up against people's expectations. These people in the room, they're not really seeing the guy with the withered hand. Not really. And he, by the way, is acutely aware of the religious expectations in the room. And I'm sure he's just back there like, oh, please, 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 no, 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 no. Because he doesn't want to be noticed. And all those religious expectations, by the way, require a whitewashing of the pain and an ignoring of the problem. That's what religious expectations often do. And, and when I talk about religious expectations and religion, I'm not just talking about, you know, people that are following this book or, or maybe another one. We have all kinds of things that we invest in our lives with sort of a religious fervor and passion and, by the way, regulations. Can I get an amen, Vikings fans? <laughs> Don't go to a game without purple and gold on, am I right? That's a religious expectation. Or are you indeed game? You go to the, go to the I, I was going to say Sue, but that'd be wrong. Go to a hockey game, you got to wear green, right? You got rules and regulations. What about the U.S. Olympic gymnast team? Rules, regulations. An internal culture. For years they had there where you whitewashed over the pain. You ignored it. You pretended everything was all right. The goal was to win medals. People believed that you had to hide the truth in order to get there. And this internal culture of everybody just be quiet allowed Larry Nasser to abuse more than 200 young gymnasts. The pain and the brokenness was always there, hiding just below, below the surface, unacknowledged, hidden because of religious expectations. And it just spread. Because those religious expectations were more important than compassion and truth and growth. I wonder how many of us today are keeping quiet about some pain. I wonder how many of us today just know that the expectation and the calling is that we need to hide in the back of the room and try to cover up our withered hand. Or I wonder how many of us here today are just thinking, Oh man, I hope they don't bring up their hand. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to address it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. Please keep quiet. Look at what Jesus does with the withered hand. 
He holds up first the religious expectations in the room. Is it okay? What do we do with this? What's the rules? And then he holds up the withered hand. And he waits to see. Will you choose to be socially acceptable? Or will you choose compassion? And they were silent. Nobody dare risk for the sake of compassion. Nobody dare risk for the sake of healing. Nobody dare challenge the social norms because then, right, then they might be out. If somebody dared to stand up and say, well, I think in this case maybe we can maybe make an exception, look at this guy, then, then they might be ostracized. No, 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 no. It's better, better for the guy with the withered hand to just stay in the back of the room than for me to join him at the back of the room, right? This is human. We all do this, as long as it's not me. And silence. Silence. That was the response. So let me ask again, how many of us today are being silent about some pain? How many of us think we're supposed to stay in the back of the room and hide our withered hand? And how many of us are just praying that someone else will remain silent? Verse 5, he looked around them, at, around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, that they would rather fit in than seek healing and wholeness. Now hold on. Before you start thinking Jesus is angry with you, here is what you need to hear. There's a part of you. There's, it's true for every single one of us here that is wounded and broken and hurt and scared and frightened and intimidated and hiding, just like that man with the withered hand in the back of the room. And there is another part of you, and this is true of every one of us here, that is pretending and measuring up and meeting expectations and standing in silence. Jesus wants to heal one of those and he's angry with another. So what do we need to do? We respond to his call. He says to the man, stretch out your hand. <laughs> see, all these biographies where we see the life of Jesus and really the, all, the whole Bible is clear. Jesus has both anger and compassion. Just like us, we have that too. can't expect anything different. His compassion is for the broken, the humble, the needy, and the desperate. His anger is toward those who would hold up a ridiculous expectation or a social norm that would prevent Jesus from doing his work of healing the broken. To every single one of us. Every one of us has something like a withered hand. We hide it. Sometimes we're ashamed of it. And we somehow, maybe it's because of bad teaching over years, or it's probably because of our hearts, but we have this idea that Jesus is angry with our withered hand. Whatever it is, you know what it is. That thing, we think Jesus is angry with that. This is a lie. It's a lie designed by the devil and this cruel world to destroy our souls, to cripple our ability to live out a gospel-centered life of freedom. And that surface part of you, part of all of us, that's telling us to live a lie, that only incites anger from Jesus. Because it's locking in the real you that is hurt and looking for healing. Everything, and I mean everything, that we are doing this year <laughs> as a body is to hopefully create a space where we are safe enough to begin to free our hands and point them out. And let people see them. Paul would write later, a long time after, well, 30, 40 years after Jesus lived, he would write 
these words, His power is made perfect in my weakness. See, here's the thing. This story about this man in the back of the room getting his hand healed, this, this story does not show off a withered hand. It uses a withered hand to point to the power of Jesus. His power to cut against religious expectations and social norms and his power to make whole what is broken. I want this group of limping, struggling, sometimes failing Jesus followers to be a place where we all hold up our withered hands and point to the power of Jesus. I want it to be a safe place where we can stretch out our broken parts for the whole world to see. And next month, we're really going to start promoting our, our gospel communities, small group. We gather. The hope is that this will be a safe place for you to know and be known. Where you can begin to feel comfortable pulling out that withered hand. There's a lot of us who have spent years faithfully attending with, with our withered hands in our sleeves. We need to grow from that. I don't want to be like a synagogue filled with religious expectations and people just trying to measure up. I want to be like a leper colony where everybody knows we're all messed up. We're not ashamed because it's right there on us. But we're moving toward healing and wholeness together. Jesus wants to show off his power. And the only way to do that is to restore what's broken. He wants, us to, he wants to invite us into deeper connection with him and with others. How do we do that? If we keep our hands in our sleeves. He wants to heal all those broken parts in all of us that we hide and hide from and hide from the world. And he has compassion. Do you see how he treats that man? The only one in the room, everybody else wants to talk about the standards, and the only one in the room that wants to say, do you see this guy? Let's talk about him. It's Jesus. Because he is passionate about pursuing you. He wants to heal you. And only he can. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you want to heal. We stay so locked up in our performance-oriented world. Oh, God, would you free us from reputation, expectation, performance. Give us wholeness. And let us uh, bring us to a point of trust that it's okay to pull out our withered hand. Would you uh, heal us from our pride and our arrogance and help us realize that none of us, none of us actually measure up and, and free us so that we can come to you and to one another and be honest about our withered hands. It's in your name we pray. Amen.